This is the Philanthropy Show, connecting and inspiring philanthropy. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. And under the authority entrusted to me by the Constitution, as endorsed by the Re resolution of the Congress, I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. A strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. Today, I can announce that the United States has agreed to formally reestablish diplomatic relations with the Republic of Cuba and reopen embassies in our respective countries. This is a historic step forward in our efforts to normalize relations with the Cuban government and people and begin a new chapter with our neighbors in the Americas. Whatever your politics are regarding Cuba, one fact remains. These are historic times. Now, this show is not about politics, but it is about an interesting relationship that is revealing and unfolding between U.S. nonprofits and Cuban organizations. <coughs> Our guests today are Ron Cristaldi with the Greater Tampa Chamber of Commerce and also Jason Woody, President and CEO of Lions Eye Institute for Transplant and Research right here in the Tampa Bay area. These two gentlemen have taken a couple of trips now down to Cuba working with some organizations with like-minded goals uh, from Cuba and I wanted to have this show because what an interesting time we're in. This is just this is going to be a very interesting show, and again, I, I want to state that this is not about the politics, but this really is about what you're developing with organizations who have kind of the same passions that we do in the nonprofit community mm -hmm. in Cuba. So, setting up the background, first off, um, Ron, you've been on the show before. I want to say thank you for, for coming again, and if you would, for those folks who haven't seen the show previously, give us a little background about you and how you got involved with the Tampa Chamber. Sure. Well, thank you for having me back here yeah. today. And if for a very exciting topic. Uh, my day job is a, an attorney with a law firm of Shoemaker, Loop and Kendrick handling a variety of business issues, but I also volunteer quite a bit as we talked about on some of your uh, previous segments. And one of the uh, capacities that I serve in this year is chair of the Greater Tampa Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. And in that capacity, we've been very active in establishing c commerce with Cuba. We've taken three trips down there wow. and be happy to talk with you all about it a little bit today. And the last trip I was accompanied by Jason here. Wow. And Jason, now you're president and CEO of the Lion's Eye Institute of Transplant Research. Right. So number one, what is that and how did you get involved in nonprofits? Well, we provide uh, corneas for people that are blind or visually impaired. People ask, uh, you know, what happens when you're an organ donor? Many of us, you know, in the society today have an organ donor on your driver's license. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're the one key. There's organs for donation. There's tissue, which is bone and skin. And, of course, there's eyes that are corneas that would be used for transplant. And so part of our process is that we provide, we're the conduit between actually the donor and the surgeon in, uh, in sight restoration for those that are blind or visually impaired. Wow. So how did this relationship developed by you contacting each other who reached and how did you get involved with Cuba? Give me the background on that. Sure. Well, our relationship really started about uh, 12 years ago or so when Jason approached me for some legal services and I now serve as the outside general counsel for the Lions Eye Institute for Transplant and Research. Um, and Jason... So you're very familiar with what they do then in that capacity. Very familiar. Okay. And, and because of the because healthcare being such a, a large segment of the uh, commerce in the Tampa Bay region, uh, I recruited Jason to come and, and participate in the chamber a little bit greater. Uh, Jason serves on the board with me now. And when we started to look at Cuba, the chamber's been very engaged in the, in the Cuba issues. Uh, we were very engaged in getting direct flights between Tampa International Airport and Cuba starting in 2010. The first flights, the inaugural flight was in September of 2011. At the time, you could only fly out of three airports in the country, Miami, New York and technically Los Angeles, although I didn't, I don't think they had any flights practically out of Los Angeles. Tampa was the fourth uh, nationally. It's about a 50 minute flight between Havana and Tampa. Uh, we've since taken three trips on flights from Tampa. And on the last trip, uh, we decided to try to um, partner some of our member organizations like the Lions Eye Institute with their counterparts in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And Jason had been down before a few times himself and it was, a, it was some, there was some good synergy there. 
you know, sometimes I regret that this show is only 30 minutes because there's so much of what you've already said that I want to jump into, but I'm going to try to give us some overviews, and we may have to go with, you know, a part two <laughs> down the road as, as things develop sure. and continue. You mentioned this is the fourth, this was the fourth market to open n flights, to nonstop flights to Cuba. So for those folks who aren't from Tampa, and I think even some of us who live here may not understand Tampa's history and its connection to Cuba. So explain that a little bit, Ron. Sure. Tampa has a long, rich uh, tradition of trade with Cuba and relationship with Cuba, really dating back to the, to the 16th century in DeSoto, but, but most recently in the cigar manufacturing industry. Mm -hmm. So the Jose Ebor uh, founded a portion of Tampa that was a cigar manufacturing district. Um, somewhat ironically, where Jason's uh, company is now located in what is called Ybor City, mm -hmm. in an old cigar factory um, that's been converted to the Lions Eye Institute. I think that's synchronistic. I don't know that it's mm -hmm. ironic. I think it's very cool. Yes, wow. it is. Yeah. Very, very synchronistic. Yeah. And and we, uh, the Cuban consulate, had been in in uh, Tampa prior to uh, the severing of diplomatic relations. And so our tradition and history mm -hmm. here is much different than even the rest of Florida, which has much more recent emigres from Cuba. Ours are over 100 years old. They're third and fourth generation Floridians, but with a long, rich tradition and history. And what I found in Cuba is the Cubans themselves um, know of Tampa. They know it well. People will say to me, um, I hear you have a park dedicated to Ho Jose Marti in Tampa, who was their equivalent of George Washington, the founder of the Cuban Republic. They will say things like, my grandfather used to take the ferry back and forth from Havana to Tampa. Um, they know about uh, Tampa. Um, people here have lots of relatives there and formerly had trade and established there. So we have this long, rich tradition in a very positive way, unlike what some of the other areas of the state and country might uh, have experienced. Well, and I, and I think personally, from, from just the point of view of hearing that, I think what's really vital for our history, too, is to know that richness that I think um, maybe has been sheltered or turned away from for a certain period of time. And so just knowing that that's a part of this history, mm -hmm. uh, not just Tampa, but Florida and the U.S. and that, that in integral relationship. Mm -hmm. So, Jason, you've been down to Cuba before before your trip with Ron. Correct. In what capacity? Uh, volunteer. You know, we've started out as part of our outreach is that we, uh, all over the world, that we offer assistance for people that are blind or visually impaired, help them to set up structures just like ours uh, that we have here in Tampa. Uh, to bring them current uh, for medical, uh, medical techniques, things that for transplantation, uh, be it India that we've gone to, you know, as far as anywhere around the world, Singapore, and Cuba was no different than that as far as, so we've gone, that would have been my sixth trip uh, to Cuba, and over the years that we've seen their abilities through transplantation, really teaching them how to fish. You know, we could provide them tissue, and you know, but it really wasn't a sustainable model. So we work with them setting up an eye bank infrastructure there, so they could help their own community. And, you know, and that's really what I appreciated about. The, the Chamber's efforts, uh, they had some guests that came down also from Moffitt, that as much as it was, it came across maybe as maybe a business side, there was really a concerted effort by the Chamber to bring a humanitarian side to the trip, that we were really giving it, that they're individuals just like us. They didn't have a choice that they were born and raised in Cuba, know that they're any place else in the world. And so at the end of the day, is that how can we still help those individuals there in the country with the humanitarian needs that, that, that we have uh, all over the world? So what would be the short-term the short term plans on this? Is, are, is it to really establish that humanitarian relationship? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And I think it's important to understand the Cubans are very sophisticated uh, people with very sophisticated technologies and, and ideas and talents as we are. And uh, it's important to understand that the short term and the long term are not uh, imperialistic or exploitation type. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not also purely giving. They're giving and getting. It's a mutual beneficial relationship. So I think what Jason and the Lions Eye Institute are looking at is opportunities to, to train individuals, opportunities to export technology both ways, opportunities to um, help with research and conduct studies that might happen across the Gulf of Mexico on both sides. Um, a lot of opportunities where if this was Canada or Mexico or some other country, uh, it would already be ongoing. But for this um, artificial divide that we've uh, uh, placed on ourselves between these two great peoples and two great nations, 
Um, now we're seeing that fall down, we're seeing that be relaxed and normalized, and these opportunities to learn from each other and to help each other really exist in, in a big way. I want to really get into what that what that looks like, and uh, I know that you had mentioned when we were talking about this show that, like you mentioned, the training aspect, having some of the doctors come up here. So we're going to take a look at a little bit further into that, but we have to take a break. So we'll take a quick break and come right back to what does this look like? Establishing relationships between U.S. nonprofits and Cuban organizations. This show sponsored in part by My Paper Pusher. Consider it done. I'm Samantha Abraham with My Paper Pusher. At My Paper Pusher, we understand that association management is just as important for your nonprofit organization as quality bookkeeping. To help strengthen and grow your organization, we also offer association management services across the state of Florida. Our administrative experts can maintain membership records, take official board minutes, manage your newsletter, respond to member queries, send meeting reminders, and update your event calendars. We also offer social media and website management to help increase awareness of your organization's mission, purpose, and goals. With these custom services tailored to meet your organization's needs, we relieve the burden of administration from board members so they have more time to focus on fundraising and programs. To learn more about our association management services, visit our website or call us today. I'm Samantha Abraham with My Paper Pusher, where you can consider it done. Follow The Philanthropy Show on Facebook for behind-the-scenes action, polls, and commentary. Welcome back to The Philanthropy Show. Very unique show today, talking about U.S. nonprofits and Cuban organiz organizations and the partnerships that are developing between them, these relationships. So first, let's go back to, with, with Ron Cristaldi and Jason Woody, what are these Cuban organizations? Are they, they, they're not nonprofits, but how would you, what would you call them? Yeah, it's an excellent question. It's important to um, understand really what we're talking about. When we say not-for-profit corporation in our culture, in our system, we're talking about two things. A corporation is a legal entity within our structure of how we organize ourselves, right. and not-for-profit is how we tax ourselves. Um, those two things really don't exist in Cuba because they're in a different system. Mm -hmm. But here, fundamentally, when we say not-for-profit corporation, we're not really talking about the legal structure or the tax status of the organization. We're talking about the mission. Mm -hmm. And whether that mission be arts and culture or, or troubled youth or any of a, a host of uh, health or social issues out there, of some kind. those types of things, and the same issues exist in Cuba. They have more of a cooperative structure that's overseen by the government but put into some private uh, organizions that can partner with uh, not-for-profits here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's the mission really on both sides of the Gulf that drive the activity, not necessarily the structure, and they have the exact same issues and needs there that we do here. Okay, so humanitarian U.S. to humanitarian Cuba and how you can, how you can find the, the synergy in mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. paint that picture for me then, Jason. What, what, what are you finding to be uh, the medical, and I would guess the educational, because you're transplant mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. um, I guess status, zone, where are they? Um, <coughs> if you probably had to look at it, probably the top 10 in the world. Really? Interesting enough, um, you, you in the United States, I was looking at numbers the other day of our GDP, less than 2% goes to education, 10% of their GDP of Cuba. Now, of course, there's a different side, goes towards education. Uh, we talk a lot about teaching, and uh, they have about 150,000 teachers in Cuba with a minimum of a five-year degree, equivalent to a master's or higher. So you really, they have a concentrated effort on education. Uh, education's free there. Everything, all the way through, all the way through medical school, education's free. You know, and they really have a true concerted effort on ha probably having one of the highest educated. At one point when I was there, they mentioned close to 70% of the population has a bachelor's degree. Their literacy rate is 96%. Wow. And so, I mean, so you look at, they really have a concerted effort on doing the providing the best education and care through, through early on education and through medical for, for their uh, community. Do they yeah. also do, like you're, you're working with, um, oh, corneas. Corneas. Do they also have that type of medical research, medical They do. Um, when I first went um, some time ago, uh, they had zero, zero, zero transplants in the country. 
Uh, now they're doing over 300 transplants. They've mimicked a system almost identical to ours, set up a local hospital, local sharing, where the community helps itself. Donors from the local community go back into local patients that are waiting. Um, where we've, so we've seen some issues is their ability to move forward due to the embargo and due to the relationship as far as equipment. They would have the same equipment that I would have here, but maybe a bulb breaks. The bulb comes from the United States, so they would have a $30,000 piece of equipment that doesn't work because of a bulb, they can't get a $10 bulb, they can't get shipped to them because the embargo, so you know, that's where and we've kind of... because that equipment doesn't necessarily come from the United States, it might have been European. Correct, and that's where the European nations are, you know, have actually helped them mm -hmm. of getting it, but there's a lot of things that still come stateside that they're not able to get. Maybe it's a computer upgrades, we know we've all upgraded our computers in the last probably six months, you know, to go in to see like, a, you know, an early Windows 2000, you know, wow. that they're using where they haven't had XP or Windows 10 or any of the new versions that are there, uh, they don't have the software. Updates so the things it can't even do so there and um, and Ron had uh, one of his groups that you know a wonderful group from Moffitt and they use our trade journals as the Bible they you know they'll go in and they'll say we saw a study that you did this we're trying to do this and they're so close to treating their patients just like we do but without the technology without maybe the medicine there and so that's the unfortunate side of uh, you know what the embargo caused behind the scenes that people don't realize it's it's often forgotten that medical science research education. Those aren't political issues. Those aren't partisan issues. Um, they are objective, and those communities don't think of themselves as partisans or, or political. Um, doctors are doctors all around the world, and they have they share a Hippocratic oath, and they want to further medical science. Um, we, as communities on both sides, have put some political and artificial barriers on those things, and part of what we're doing is trying to work to break those things down. And we think that see how you can how you can relate. So where does that go then? What does that relationship look like? You mentioned uh, possibly bringing up doctors here. You going down and so what would that look like? Well, uh, we have three doctors uh, in the visa process. We received the, received their paperwork last week, uh, so they've already filed their visas to come to the United States through the United States the U.S. Embassy here. Um, so that process will go. We're hoping to have them here in October. Uh, they'll be here for close to two weeks, uh, immersed in training pretty close eight hours a day for their entire time, so it's not a pleasure trip. You know, here to look at the technologies, meet with our ophthalmologists, go into our surgery centers, see the technologies. A lot of the things they can learn, they can learn hands-on. Maybe it's just a hand surgical technique that doesn't involve equipment. And so that's going to be one of our first. Always now, it's easier for me to go back here. As Ron had mentioned, I mean, we've got you know flights a week, every week that I can go in and out. So what they learn, we can go back to make sure that they're doing and so all of a sudden now we can have this reciprocal relationship what's interesting we're both seeing especially for site related issues in older population so they're seeing the same thing that we're facing here is now the baby boomers de eye diseases glaucoma macular degeneration the things you're hearing they're having the same thing but interesting they're having different rates there so all of a sudden they're seeing it much older than we're seeing it here younger so how can we start comparing our data to two remote Areas completely separated from each other of, of how the well, disease are progressing. That's correct. On, on that could be dietary, could be you know lifestyle. What do we like, and how can we learn from them? Maybe they're you know from that side or at least comparison. And if I was going to say, if I was watching the program, I might be asking myself, well, what does this mean for me? How have things changed? Um, make no mistake, the embargo is still in place. The travel ban is still in place, but there are 12 authorized areas of travel that are permitted currently. And what we have seen over the past three years, and I've seen it personally, I've been working very hard. I had an opportunity to go to the White House and meet with Vice President Biden. I've met with Secretary of Commerce Pritzner, and I've met with representatives of Treasury and State. I've met with the current ambassador, uh, the newly appointed ambassador to uh, Cuba, Ambassador Desiro. I've met with the uh, uh, Cuban ambassador, Cabanas. And there is clearly, over the past three years, momentum toward normalization. There's clearly an enthusiasm on the part of the American administration toward that process of opening up and, and establishing more normal relations. So what, what companies and, and people who are, want to engage in Cuba, they need to be very mindful of the still very complex regulations out there, mm -hmm. but they also need to, be very, um, they need to be very progressive in their preparation because standing flat-footed right now mm -hmm is not an option. Um, when we were there last, when Jason and I were there last in May, the President of France had just left the country the day before. 
Um, there are people from all over our country who are visiting. Uh, Governor Cuomo from New York had been there about two weeks before. There's a lot of activity right now. The Cubans realize that opening themselves up a little bit more is, is their future. And so in order to uh, best engage, best develop those relationships, those mutually beneficial relationships, the time is really now. Well, and you're keeping the focus of, again, from that humanitarian standpoint, you're keeping the focus of trying to elevate humanity as opposed to getting enmeshed and in giving, in giving and exchanging mm -hmm. techniques and skills and information uh, for the benefit of the populations. And I think that's, you know, that's, Ron, when you and I were first talking about the show, that's one of the things that I saw as an incredible value in doing that and exploring outside of what's going on politically from a person-to-person -person standpoint, mm -hmm. how can we connect um, globally, really, mm -hmm. with this? Because this is an international uh, issue. So mm -hmm. I, what are the, you know, I, this still has to be challenging for you in trying to arrange, like you said, you get to apply for the visa for the doctors to come in. They can come in for two weeks. They, um, they're probably monitored in some way. What are the challenges that you're finding in progressing through this relationship? One thing I always advise my clients is good legal advice, <laughs> yeah. particularly in a highly regulated area. But, but I think um, first there's a trepidation. Um, although there's opportunity, it's confusing and undaunting to figure out what the state of the current regulations are. And there's trepidation on folks' part to engage because they don't know, quite know what to do. Um, information is out there. There are folks um, who can help uh, navigate the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, making sure that you don't step out of line is a very important thing. No one wants to put their mission at risk uh, by trying to do something but uh, stepping in the wrong direction unwittingly. And then I think, um, in my experience, uh, individuals in Cuba are very interested in engaging in U.S. They, there's a very warm reception that I received by folks there. I think Jason did as well. Um, we brought uh, one individual, uh, came back after our May trip, and just to give you a, a, an anecdotal story, I had dinner with him, and he's wearing a tie with little Florida, uh, little Florida's on the tie. And so uh, his name was Nolito, and I said, Nolito, where did you get the tie? And he said, um, in the early 60s, three of his uncles left the country, and his father and his aunt stayed in the country. And for 20 years, uh, they didn't get a chance to talk. Mm -hmm. And in the mid-80s, his uncle came back to visit when he was a, a younger guy, and his uncle gave him this tie. And he said at the time, I remember saying to my uncle, I can't wear this tie. It's the, it's the tie of the enemy here. I'll, I'll, I can't wear it. And his uncle said to him, Nalita, someday you'll come and visit Florida. You hold this tie, and when you come to Florida, you can wear this tie. And he said to me, today I came to Florida and I'm wearing this tie. People have been waiting a long time to open up and do those things. Um, the time is now, and, and it's really, again, an opportunity to not stand flat-footed, but to be on, on top of this and, and open up and make things happen from a person-to-person -person perspective. Wow, that's an impactful yeah. story. Gosh, we're gonna take another break, but when we come back, I wanna talk a little bit about what is the impact on Tampa? And what is the impact on Florida and the United States with, with the progress, the goals that you have in going? So one more break and we'll be right back with The Philanthropy Show. And now a word from our studio sponsor. Hi, I'm Jen Dodd, Education Manager at the Nonprofit Leadership Center, and I want to share a quick test for social media managers thinking of adding user-generated content to their, their channels. Answer these questions and you'll be ready to pepper your feed and increase your reach by showcasing your friends and followers' own content. First ask, are we ready for this? If you've just started your nonprofit social media campaign, concentrate on executing your strategy and finding your voice. But if you've got content creation, curation, and scheduling down, now's the time to branch out into user-generated content. Next up, how are we gonna collect the content? The easiest option is to ask your friends to tag their posts with a very specific hashtag and search that tag regularly. Now ask, what kind of content do we want? Give your users clear directions to help them showcase something unique about your nonprofit. Ask for their best photo of a recognizable spot on your campus or for a video sharing a memory about a favorite staff member. Then, how often are we going to feature that content? Daily? Weekly? Maybe monthly? Last question. Are we going to reward our friends in any way? 
Giveaways can be tricky to maintain over time and are not always well thought of by donors. So think about this question carefully. Whatever else you do, always, always give credit for the content. Here's one parting thought. You'll save some time generating content by sharing your fans' posts, but be prepared to spend that same amount of time monitoring and responding if the post goes viral, which is a nice problem to have. For more tips like these, join us at a class at the Nonprofit Leadership Center where we educate, empower, and connect nonprofits. The Philanthropy Show is on demand every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at both thephilanthropyshow.com and YouTube slash watch MVVP TV. Welcome back to The Philanthropy Show. We are talking about a, a heavy but really impactful issue, and that is um, U.S. nonprofits working with Cuban organizations and in a very humanitarian effort, exchanging information, what that looks like going forward. And, and I want to get to the point that we talked about right before the break. What does this, how is this impacting Tampa, Florida, the U.S. with this kind of development? How do you see that? I, th I think it's really impacting Tampa Bay region here much more acutely than it would any other part of the United States. Because of the Be because of the, Yeah, because of the fact that Florida first is very closely situated. Uh, the, the Port of Tampa and the Port of Manatee are fantastic ports. They're very close deep water ports to the Port of Anna. Uh, we've got an airport that's a 50 minute flight away that already has nine or ten nonstop flights a week and our airport and our airport director have done a fantastic job of facilitating that. Uh, we were the historic seat of the consulate in Cuba and we're hopeful that the consulate will be reestablished in the Tampa Bay area. Uh -huh. Both the chamber and city council in, in the city of Tampa have passed resolutions supporting that. Um, and I think it'll be impactful because um, the Cuba is a market of about 12 million people. Um, they certainly have needs for services there. They have needs for uh, things like IT infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, construction services, concrete, steel, those types of things. Um, and, and for exchanges for things like healthcare, which is a big industry here. So the impact that a 12 million person market could have on a region like Tampa Bay is certainly very significant. And it's, again, our opportunity to either pass on or take, and we're trying our best to uh, be aggressive in our, in our, in our challenges to um, our region to be ready to go uh, as things get more and more normalized. And I think the Cubans are ready as well. Yeah. And how do you see it impacting the medical community? Well, an exchange of ideas. I mean, they're brilliant surgeons. I mean, who would not want from, you know, if it was, you know, a Japanese, you know, and we know that we see technology from Japan, you know, from all over the world, they're brilliant to come and not benefit us as well. So there's things that they've worked on um, there may be in isolation that they haven't been able to share with other people are things, you know, it's that missing link, that missing, you know, for them to attend the same seminars, to attend meetings, to share just openly information that they've been working on there. How um, many times they haven't had the resources to do it, to follow through. So, you know, so there we look at collaboration. I think that one, to help them, but also I, I have no doubt that it's going to be help, it's going to help the U.S. community as well, is, I mean, they're, like I said, they're brilliant individuals. And, uh, and I said, some of the things, the concepts, the things that they've worked on, uh, we've never, maybe we've never looked at before, not through their eyes. Wow. Well, and as I said earlier on the show, I think this is definitely probably going to be a two-parter, maybe more. <laughs> so as we progress and we say, you know, reach out the invitation, invite you gentlemen back on the philanthropy show and give us an update of what has transpired and where you've progressed. Yeah. So cool. Thanks for what you're doing. Yeah, of course. So we're going to end the show with our, our trademark, which is truth or care. And that is, and Ron, I know you've answered before, you can have the same one or come up with something else, but it's your heart's definition of philanthropy. Yeah why you do what you do, mm -hmm. how you became engaged in connecting, not just from the mental of I want to help, but what is it about you know, this story? It might be a story, might be an example, might be just a feeling. Mm -hmm. but, so what is, and I'm going to make you go first, sure. because Jason's the new guy, so you can do Happy to do that. Hopefully my, <laughs> hopefully my answer is cl close to last time. I, I think it is because my motivations are the same. Mm -hmm. um, it goes back to good mentoring um, and the mentors that uh, taught me, one mentor in particular who taught me to uh, pick things that my heart is in, mm -hmm. pick the things that I believe in, that I want to engage in, and that are core to my values, and then get very engaged in them, take a leadership role. And that got accelerated and heightened as I started to have my own kids. Mm -hmm. um, getting involved with the Tampa Chamber of Commerce, for instance, is an example of how um, ten and a half years ago when my, when my first son was born, I realized that I had a responsibility to not only 
uh, make this world a better place during my lifetime, but to leave it better off than I found it, because my children were going to have to make their way, and the platform that we build is the platform, is the only platform they have to build on. Um, all of my work with the Chamber and the other not-for-profits that I've been engaged in is driven by those considerations. I love that. That's great. Jason? Well, um, starting on, I was a surgical nurse, and uh, you know, some time ago, uh, this uh, year I'll be celebrating 25 years, the right. Lions Eye Institute. So I started when I was six. Um, so <laughs> for those uh, doing uh, the uh, doing the math, but um, interesting enough that I saw a case there. I was actually a surgical nurse at Tampa General, where um, a young man, uh, his mother was dying, and uh, as far as she had polycystic kidney disease, mm -hmm. and the only donor was her son, and he already had early stages of the disease and I, and I saw them in the operating room holding hands and she goes don't do this because what if you, there's not a kidney for you and he said no mom he goes I want to save your life and we went through that process and the transplant went fine and you know it struck me right then is this the ability to help others and I think that's how I've been so especially the vein of transplantation that I've been involved in is you know it's just amazing that you know you have the gift you know be it during life or after life mm -hmm. as far as to help somebody else through that. And I mean, I've seen so many, since our inception in 1973, we brought 65,000 people, the gift of sight. Yeah. So you think about the impact that it's made on their families, mm -hmm. their individual lives. And uh, you know, and I think that's what's been, as, as you know, Ron mentioned, I think, and I don't look sometimes, it is global, but it's like, it's true, is you know, you leave that community a little bit better each and every day than the way you found it. And you know, as far as you know, what can my way give back? Many of my donor families, are, you know, are recipients. I'll never be able to see. But I wonder, will they be the next president? Will they come up with a, a new cure for disease? What will they do now that they've had their sight? I think uh, many of us, you know, that's probably the one handicap that many of us think every day that if we were to lose anything, we wouldn't want to lose our vision. Mm -hmm. And so, as far as and so, I think you know, what's that next person? What they're going to do? What do they mean, you know, to their family and to their lives? Huh? and now that it's been restored. That's beautiful, and that's where passion meets purpose. Right. And I, I just love how you shared that, you know, it's not just the sight being restored, which we say just, but having anybody's sight, that mm -hmm. one person is so grateful for that, right. but their families, and whatever they're doing that impacts the other people right. that are in their lives, mm -hmm. and whatever they may come up with, whatever mm -hmm. mentoring they may do to somebody mm -hmm. else, that has, that has influenced it. Mm -hmm. Just this big connected circle. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys. For thank you very much for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much, you. Thank Jason. you for having me. I appreciate it. And that wraps up the Philanthropy Show today. Be sure to go to thephilanthropyshow.com and check out the past shows tab for all of our past shows. And join us again next Monday at 4 for an all-new show. See you. If you have an idea for The Philanthropy Show, contact us via our website or email us at tps at myvideovoice.com.